Welcome back to another Box Score Geek show. I'm um, not going to lie to you, my fair listener. I've actually already pre-labeled the title of this week's show. I'm going to call it Filler. The good news for you is we've actually been doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work on potential features and stuff coming for the upcoming NBA season. We're so close. I'm so looking forward to this. Um, not as much news to talk this week, but we did have a few fun topics we batted around, so we'll throw those to you. Uh, with that, I'm your host, Andres Alvarez. You can find me on Twitter as Nerd Numbers, uh, and our producer is Brian Foster. You can find on Twitter as Box Score Brian. Give a shout out, Brian. Hey, good evening, Dre. And um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of kind of current events, politics type of shows recently, and you know those are a lot of fun during the off season. But to have you know more stats based show that'll be exciting, and I'm sure a lot of people will be ready for that today. Uh, well, like, for instance, last week's show, a fun one, I was traveling during the weekend and a, a topic we decided to discuss was Kevin Johnson. I won't even lie to you. I didn't really read the articles in depth as I like. It felt like homework, candidly. Uh, That's and right. a funny, a funny follow up to that is Patrick actually sent me another article on Kevin Johnson. So if you missed last week's show, what you can rest assured of is Kevin Johnson apparently is a supervillain and a horrible human being, which is a bizarre thing for a former NBA guard. Breaks my heart. A Cal Bear as well, Dre. Breaks my heart. It, it turns out where you went to school doesn't necessarily dictate if you'll be a good person or not. Oddly enough, I'm actually wearing a, a CSU Rams shirt today. We so are a public funny. university, Dre, so we don't discriminate. Supervillains are allowed to. <laughs> Fair enough. I will say one thing uh, to CSU, anybody uh, working for CSU who's watching. This is the most I've contributed to CSU since graduating. I have bought a shirt. I actually got a letter in the mail today, you know, the classic, hey, you graduated. You want to give us money to help us out? And the answer is no. Uh, I absolutely hate colleges and their, you know, if you graduate from them, they're just incessant peppering you of please give us money, please give us money, please give us money. It drives me even more nuts that it that it works. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, one of my personal heroes, he actually went on a tirade against like Harvard and is like, do they really need millionaires donating lots of money to them? Money bag CSU. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's well. I mean, like one thing about CSU, and this is I, I won't lie, this is gorgeous. There's something at CSU known as the Oval. Uh, which is just this like area to walk through campus that has these trees. It's an oval, like it's an oval roundabout kind of place to drive through with a bunch of buildings around it. It's got a bunch of trees there, a bunch of nice stuff to walk through. It is it is gorgeous, and I guess it was um, built by a famous architect or designed by a famous architect, something like that. And, you know, I got like a letter about like, hey, do you want to give us money to help make the oval more beautiful? And this is just one of those things about school in general that drives me nuts, which is, when they ask you for money and you're like, oh, you're an institute of higher learning, so I'm going to probably give you money to help students or whatever. And they're like, no, we really need a climbing wall in our gym. And no joke, CSU has a climbing wall in their gym. Climbing, you know, you need education to learn how to climb as well. I guess. But, yeah, it's one of those reasons I've never, I've never been such a huge fan of schools after the fact. And there are lots of great documentaries. I think there is value in college, but there is definitely a problem with the college system. We discuss this all the time in regards to athletics. There's also a problem in general about how colleges like to spend their money. Um, mm. And it, it's, it's become less and less about students and more and more about overhead and other things. I hadn't even intended for this to be on the show, Brian, but, but a fun first Yeah, topic. this is a huge topic, isn't it? And, you know, it's funny. Back when I graduated from college, people make fun of me from this. But for me, it seems like a long time ago, back in, you know, the turn of the millennium type of time. Did you graduate right when I was entering? Geez, you are old. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> but no, I felt the same way. Again, I'll throw my proud University Cal Berkeley under the bus again. But one thing I noticed is when my political science program graduated, there were, you know, people were getting honors and all that. And, um, you know, a lot of the people getting honors there, I was not a fan of as GSIs, and they were getting honors for their research. So what is GSI? Oh, sorry, graduate student instructor. So they were like, you know, my grad student teachers. So that's so I drew probably, you know, a bad data correlation at the time. But I was like, oh, this is why these guys weren't great teachers. They're spending all their time on research. Oh, funny, funny. The topic. guys I liked got no recognition. I went to CSU, um, which is uh, another C start. But uh you know, it was also a research university, and that was a major problem. And I actually fell under this, which is an easy way to get 
graduate students funding was to have them be teacher's assistants. And there was nothing given to like validate, sorry, my dog's intrigued in this as well, but there was nothing in there to guarantee you'd be a good teacher's assistant. So yeah, like I, you know, nothing against the guy and, you know, it's impossible for this not to come out sounding like, you know, complete uh, red state American. But, you know, I had some people that couldn't really even speak English that well that were, you know, um, foreign students that had been, you know, brought to do research and they were like, we don't have any money to pay you for research, but if you teach this course, you can, you know, get funding. And it's like, you know, I had a guy that was le legitimately off an airplane the day before. And he said that he's like, he's like, he's like, yeah, you know, I, they told me I was teaching this course yesterday. I just arrived yesterday from China. And you're like, oh, wow. Well, clearly there, you know, clearly there was a lot of vetting done for this person who is, you know, mm teaching the class that, you know, if I looked, I was in state tuition, but an out of state tuition person could have looked at their things and been like, this class is legitimately costing me 1500 to $3,000. And uh, the vetting they gave to the teacher was, uh, do we need to fund you for research? Yeah, yeah, man. No, it's a big topic. And it's coming up a lot now. Even, um, even liberals are pushing towards maybe more trade schools and things like that. So yeah, we we, we got to move on, but uh, maybe we can talk about. We, this we don't necessarily have to move on, but it is. <laughs> I mean, it is true. This this actually, I will let this tie in perfectly to college sports. It's if you look at what the goal of a university should be, versus what it does. It is perfectly fine. This is a very what Silicon Valley thing. This is what Steve Jobs was notorious for. Is you know focus on your core competencies. Mm. Like, why does a school need to have, a, you know, essentially a minor league football team? Why does a school need to have, you know, essentially a Bally's Total Fitness 24-hour gym? Why does a school need to, you know, basically have its own internet cafe, right? That If you're trying to look at what a school needs versus what they actually spend their money on, it is perfectly fine to do that. And that, that you know, both as former students ourselves that are looking at, you know, how schools are spending their money now and asking for, you know, graduates to give money to spend as well as college athletics it is just worth asking like why do you need this i would guess the traditional answer academically anyway is well we're trying to produce well-rounded people not just specialists but well you got to do it in an efficient way though right maybe we can supplement it with more online courses these days which they didn't have back then as much but yeah tough answer well, it, the, the funny thing there and what they will tell you and uh we might we might talk this topic a little more uh, on this podcast about marketing is the argument all the schools will give you is a it's it's to recruit students right if another big mm. university has a gym we need a gym to recruit the students if they have a fabulous you know four million dollar library we need a fabulous five million dollar mansion that kind of stuff and it's kind of it's one of these tragedy of the commons um competition things i've heard people mention this about hockey players wearing helmets where basically it was a really, really good thing for the NFL to just say, look, you have to wear helmets with visors for, for hockey players, for their health. Just a fantastic thing all around for the, the health of, of hockey players. I think I haven't looked at any data to see if it's like NFL helmets where, you know, giving them helmets makes them act more reckless. But regardless, that was probably a good thing. But if you were in the NHL and you wanted to wear a helmet for your own well-being, but nobody else was wearing a helmet and arguably it gives them better field of vision and, you know, macho culture and all that – there was no reason for you to ever put on a helmet. So it's the same thing with schools. It's like it would be better for all schools if they said, look, no more $5 million expensive things to try and attract students. But the problem is no one has put those in place. So all the schools say we need a winning football team. We need a giant library. We need all of these extra amenities. Uh, and, yeah, we could go an entire podcast just on that. Oh, good stuff, Dre. Good stuff. All right, so actually, let's get into our uh, kind of our first subject. I'm really happy about this. We have a sponsor for the show, uh, OwnThePlay.com, which is a daily fantasy site. Uh, and I'm gonna, you know, you've seen all the ads for all the big daily fantasy sites. I, I've got nothing but good things to say about them. The reason I'm promoting this one is just the absurd deal they are giving you. If you go to OwnThePlay.com, create an account. If you deposit at at least just only, and I when I say at least only one dollar, even supplies your PayPal account. If you use the keyword geek25, we'll put that in the show notes, but if you use geek25 to deposit $1 on Own the Play, they will give you $25 to play daily fantasy sports. Uh, for those of you that don't know daily fantasy sports that well and are listening to this podcast, I'm shocked, but allow me to be the first person to explain it to you. Basically, it is just like your season-long fantasy league, except 
you draft a new team every week. So ownthe use the keyword geek25 when you deposit at least a dollar and they'll give you a free $25. They've got lots of wonderful low stakes tournaments. So, you know, that $25 can last you like three years. So go ahead and do that. Uh, you know, it helps us keep the lights on around here uh, if you're interested in that. And, and that's where we're going. And uh, Brian, one thing I was interested about is we're yes, talking sir. daily fantasy sports. Every, clearly, they're everywhere. They're on this podcast as well. You listen to any podcast, you have heard a DraftKings or a FanDuel ad. Uh, you said you were just at TwitchCom. And so first off, what, what is TwitchCom? And you also mentioned that DraftKings and eSports made a big splash there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, yeah, TwitchCon went down this weekend. And, um, you know, I, I was complaining that I wasn't prepared to talk about it, but I absolutely will. So we'll see if I can cover most of what I wanted to here. But yeah, so behind the scenes stuff for those listening. Yeah, pre-show Brian and I talked about this. Like, and I don't I asked know what to it, say. I asked him, I was like, you ready to talk about this? He said, not really. And I said, oh, well, then I brought it up anyway. So keep going, Brian. But you didn't throw me under the bus. I agreed to talk about it. So, no, it's fine. But, no, TwitchCon was awesome. Um, it's the first one they've ever had. It was a convention so, for so Twitch.tv here in San Francisco area. And, um, you know, we we broadcast on Twitch, of course, but we have a lot of um, YouTube and iTunes and Stitcher listeners and Libsyn. So a lot of people probably don't know a lot about it. But basically what they do is streaming video targeted at gaming. They were a spinoff of Justin TV which used to do um, live casting. You could stream all kinds of stuff there. Um, even, they had Justin TV Sports as well. But they ended up splitting off into TwitchCon, focusing on gaming, which is their core competency. And they now have something like the fourth highest amount of internet traffic of all sites in the world. So, yeah, really? every, yeah absolutely. They're, um, so but, who's, who's in front of them? Obviously, YouTube's one of them, but who else? I think Netflix and Amazon. Yeah. Wow, that, that makes complete sense. Yeah. Yeah. So um, don't quote me on that. I'm totally pulling that out of my ass. But anyway, it's something, you know, all those guys are in the top 10 anyway. I'm pretty confident of that. So, yeah, so Twitch uh, was actually bought by Amazon uh, last year for almost a billion dollars. And now they're using that really? cash. Really? Only to, a billion? I was going to say, because, yeah. like, YouTube went for, like, a billion back in the day, and that was years ago. So I'd, I would have assumed it Maybe just I'm, like, place. an order of magnitude off. Maybe it was, like... Yeah, uh, I, mean, I feel I'll, like it was 900 million something, but anyway. Well, I'm just saying if Amazon, you know, if Amazon got Twitch, um, and I'm actually trying to look this up, that's why you can hear typing. Go for it, yeah. But, you know, like when YouTube was such a big thing, uh, you know, Google, I think, spent, what, $2 billion on them back in the day. Mm. Yeah, and you're, you're right. It's a billion dollars. So I think they had to have gotten a steal if you're saying their traffic's as big as it is. And I do... You know, I love you, YouTube, but I will say if we're looking at technology stacks, um, I have been a slightly bigger fan of Twitch, at least for like live broadcasting, yeah. persistent URLs, all that jazz. So actually, that's one of the most interesting things from TwitchCon. And, you know, this is kind of going to be a streaming media topic. So we'll, you know, sorry for the people that don't like that stuff. But basically, yeah, the um, so Twitch and YouTube have been partnered for one thing. Like, so when we broadcast here on Twitch, I'm just going to make click a button and say export to YouTube afterwards. And that's what most people do. Uh, Twitch has been historically weak in their videos on demand, their VODs, and YouTube has been weak on streaming, but of course they're amazing for their VODs. People make, like PewDiePie make millions of dollars there. It's, it is worth noting that Amazon itself is amazing for video on demand. Yes, if it, yes. Like, you know, when we talked to the Mighty Ducks a few weeks ago, you know, I just went to Amazon, purchased all three of the movies, got a lot of really weird suggestions from Amazon. And I, you know, there's not a, there's not a button yet on Amazon to click and say, I bought this to do a podcast on nostalgia and these are horrible movies. Please stop thinking that I want more movies like these, but what are you going to do? Yeah, that's right. We won't follow you for that decision. Very smart one, Dre. But no, um, actually, YouTube was supposedly going to buy Twitch like it was a done deal, but Amazon jumped in at the end. And it made a lot of sense, right? The streaming. Really? Like Google didn't come in with more. Like, that sounds no. like me, you know, my part to be like, Twitch was like, we want a billion dollars. And Google's like, listen, who pays a billion dollars for a streaming, like for like online video services, says the company acquired for two billion. So, I mean, the stuff being said in public and again, who knows what went on behind the scenes. But this is what they said is basically we thought it would be a better fit with Amazon as a company and they would let us do what we wanted more and continue doing what we're doing. So that was what was said. I imagine the amounts that were offered were similar, but um, but yeah, but that I mean it would have made sense though, right? Twitch has the great streaming platform. YouTube has the great you know video on demand platform. They merged together, awesome. But they went a separate way, so 
Amazon. Oh, and by by the way, I'm going to correct myself. Apparently, I just looked up the Wikipedia article. Mm. YouTube was acquired um, from by Google for 1.65 billion. So. Oh wow! Now, but that was 2007, right? Or 2006? I think yep. the time was different. The economy, well, maybe. Yeah, def- definitely think there was more money out there, so the demand wasn't as much. But I am surprised. I am surprised to basically, because I mean, this almost seems sportsish, and maybe I'm wrong. But you know, in sports, it gets funny where James Harden and the Oklahoma City Thunder, who should have been, can you imagine that 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 rivalry, man? Could you have imagined uh, James Harden, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook against Steph Curry, Andre Iguodala, Clay Thompson? <laughs> you know, can you imagine that kind of rivalry? Can you imagine that team? Can you? I mean, we got the Rockets out of it, so that's fine. But could you have imagined the Thunder in like the West scenario right now with all the great teams going on? And that didn't happen. So it's like, but that was basically an argument over $4 million, right? That That's what that contract came mm, down to. So you're saying that could have been Twitch and YouTube there. And so that's what I'm saying is when you're telling me it's a billion dollars and they're, you know, you're getting all of this stuff you're saying at the end, you know, Amazon feels like a better fit and blah, 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 blah. I would love to see the transcripts of the yes. very end of those meetings to feel to see like what was the breaking point because if it was like thirty you know if it was like thirty million dollars in a different vesting strategy, uh, I'm willing to bet that that's probably the case. I, I can't speak to it. I you know clearly I am not involved in multi billion dollar Silicon Valley deals, but I'm willing to bet it was something silly like that because all of the stuff about psychology and mergers. Yeah, and, and maybe stuff, different guys on the board had different opinions, so they went different ways and had a compromise. Like who knows how that stuff happens? We better get Chris Ye involved here to search. Actually, this one out. I, I'm I'm probably um, if you're if you're watching Chris, um, I after this I'm actually probably going to email him just to ask that because that does entertain me and. Uh, Chris is like a really amazing person about all this stuff. So, and by yeah. the way, throwing out another thing, if you haven't read The Alliance by Chris Ye, you owe there it to yourself. And actually, Chris is, uh, he's one of my favorite bloggers. And this isn't surprising. Dave Barry and Chris Ye are two of my favorite bloggers. And something that they have done that I have yet to do is they're both published authors. And it's really easy to notice if one of your favorite online providers um, in terms of like blogs, it's really e- easy to notice when they're in the thick of writing a book because their blog content like just drops. Oh, is and that so, confirmed, Dre? Is he writing a book right now? Uh, I don't know who we're talking about, but Dave I know Barry. Dave, Barry, Dave Barry was finishing up an economics textbook. And so, Ooh. and he'd even said that, you know, I think on Twitter a couple times, you know, hey, I'm finishing this up or whatever. So his content dropped, but like Chris, when he was writing The Alliance, of course, his dropped. But he's had a, some stuff in it, Ventures and Capitalism, which is his fantastic blog that you owe it to yourself to follow. But he is one of my favorite authors and most knowledgeable people on these subjects. Speaking of Dave Barry and the Thunder, though, I'd be forever grateful to the Thunder, not just because they enabled this Warriors championship this year, which, of course, as the bias homer I am, I'm happy about, but also the James Harden trade is what led me to start reading more about basketball and come across the Wages of Wins and meet you guys for the first time. So There you go. There I you do go. like I, I do like that James Harden is one of our, like, this was clearly such the obvious move. You know, the thing I'll always give Arturo forever, and he's still right on is, you know, James Harden is essentially the greatest shooting guard since Michael Jordan. I'd yeah. argue um, Dwayne Wade. but the Or one- Manu Ginobili. Well, okay, so let's let's talk those two. By the way, this is just an all over the place podcast, everybody. So thanks. Well, for maybe those new tools might be useful for comparing those guys. But yeah, okay, and so let. But oh, back to do, Twitch so, and YouTube, though. You so want to go back it, there? It's finished. Yeah, we. But, okay. But by the way, one thing I've been trying to work on on this show is. I do go off on tangents, but I try and string myself back. For anybody that just listened to that segment, I can't tie everything together. We're just going to talk a little more esports and daily fantasy and what you saw at Twitch, TwitchCon, and yeah. then we'll move on from there. So TwitchCon, like a uh, big site, and the reason I was interested is you actually mentioned that daily fantasy sports, and then I'm assuming because it was at TwitchCon, the connection to esports was was prevalent there as well. Yeah, so um... – yeah, DraftKings had a big booth at TwitchCon, which was interesting to me. And they were probably there because of esports, because all the esports, for the most part, other than, you know, a few like international, you know, China and Korea, of course, have their own language companies and all that. But for the most part, English language esports in North America and Europe is all on Twitch now. And um, it's big. They get, you know, we've talked about before, right? Dota, the international, go out and check, check out that. Episode. And so that's Defense of the Ancients, Defense and we're talking the esports, which is yeah. a multi-person uh, esport where teams play other teams, which is amazing. And as you mentioned, right. one of the most recent uh, televised ones of those, you know, had like million-dollar prize pools for the winners. 
Yeah, that's right. So they're starting to get a lot of eyeballs, and they're, they're eyeballs of a demographic that sites like DraftKings and um, who is at TwitchCon, and um, yeah, and everyone else wants as well. So yeah, it's interesting. Everyone's moving in. There's a lot of rumors there on the panels that um, there is going to be a lot of VC moving into esports companies next year, too. You and, said some stuff on this was interesting, yes. and if you're allowed to put it on the record, I'm interested in. in no, this, this is all. These are all on public panels okay, that are perfect. on Twitch, so this is no insider information. But um, yeah, there's just some old, you know, more old school guys. Uh, Scott Smith, you know, at Sir, Sir Scoots was one of them on a panel, and he's just saying, you know, a lot of these big companies coming in just don't know what they're doing, and they're not going to get their return for what they're spending. So. He's a little bit worried because, you know, he's an old school guy and he loves it and he doesn't. And it's what he said is it's happened a few times, basically, that, um, you know, starting kind of in the mid 2000s and uh, maybe even a little before that, there's been a few kind of boom and bust cycles of investment into esports and no one's ever done it right. And it's kind of always gone back to the grassroots. So we'll see what happens. Um, one thing about it is even though it has all these eyeballs, it's not really monetized that well like they um were, i don't want to get too like you know media well did, did they talk I'm, I'm actually really interested and this applies to sports as well yes. because in Same terms thing, of right streaming sports online so so let's talk uh, uh i'm gonna keep this in daily yep. fantasy sports one thing i know that is starting to drive people mad is daily fantasy sports ads and we're, we're part of the problem now happy to join um Give us your money. But anyway, the, the issue being that so much of the money for both advertising and whatever is still tied to this monolithic, you know, the cable system, right? I need yes. to buy a cable package to see football and basketball and baseball. And if I want to get like league pass or whatever and see it on my TV, I still need to have like a cable subscription to be able to do that. And a lot of media has moved to online, right, digital stuff. I watch a lot of stuff at my computer and even stuff like I have Chromecast, you know, the little – I have Chromecast and Amazon Fire, those two things you plug in your TV. I never use them. I use my PlayStation 3, but it use, does the same thing, right? I, I plug a box into my TV. The box can connect to the internet. I can stream stuff through the internet to my TV. But you still see basically a majority of the money for advertisement and payment going to the cable systems and not the new thing. And that's what's really interesting to me because, yeah, I, I think they're right, is that we have this online system that has all the viewers in the world, but monetizing it still, monetizing all those eyeballs still hasn't really paid off. And part of the problem, I think, is like the golf issue where I was watching a documentary on bowling. And the bowling documentary brought up that if you compared the eyeballs to people that would stop on ESPN and watch bowling, as opposed to the people that would stop on ESPN and watch hockey, they were, bowling was much better than hockey. But if you looked at how much advertisers were willing to pay for an ad on bowling versus hockey, hockey was still much higher. And I'm assuming it's, you know, demographics. They assume people who watch hockey have more money or whatever. But that's kind of the same problem. I think a lot of the people spending ad money don't, don't view online viewers as, as profitable. So even if you get, you know, you talked to PewDiePie earlier, like, PewDiePie gets, you know, billions of viewers or something, right? Or billions of views, I guess would be the right phrase. And yeah, I think his popular videos get over a million views, basically. Like, once you hit a million views, that's pretty big for YouTube. But but the problem, is you're saying, is he's making millions of dollars. And if you yes. look at that, we, we've talked the billion to million problem, right? A billion, for those of you that don't know math, well, I know I'm going to sound like a oh, condescending PewDiePie, ass. PewDiePie, by the way, he's just a YouTube um, content provider. He puts up tons of YouTube videos. He gets millions of views. That's who he is. Sorry, keep going. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, by the way. I, I really appreciate when you had like footnotes and stuff when I just start on tangents. So anyway, but yeah, if you if you get a, you know, a billion is a thousand million. So if someone's getting billions of views in a year and they make millions of dollars, you can see the conversion rate is not that fantastic. So um, that that's kind of one of those funny issues. And I'd be interested at any of the insight at Twitch, TwitchCon that you heard. Yeah, and um, no, it's so... Yeah, the online ads, they just don't have the CPM that, you know, the TV ones do. And, and CPM is yeah. short for, for non-people uh, that yeah. do online advertising. CPM is short for? Oh, I don't actually know. Uh, cost per million or something like that? I don't know it. Sorry. But basically what it means is how much do you get for those ads? You know, how much do you get paid for serving them to your customers, right? 
So if CPM is low, you're not getting much money for serving ads to your customers. If it's high, you're getting more per ad. So yeah, it's, they call them impressions. So anyway, I'm, I'm an amateur of that kind of stuff. So someone who does know about advertising, yeah, please blow us up on Twitter in the comments and set us straight on it. But yeah, the point is, is these guys, um, you know, they stream all these hours, they get tons of viewers, but they just don't get paid as much money for it as people who run the advertisements in traditional mediums. But so that's what they need to do, right? They need to build up their ad sales force, these internet companies, and find a way to sell ads to more traditional companies for more money and convince them that the demographic they have, you know, is going to follow through. So, you know, it's, it's been kind of slow in comparison to the growth of these sites anyway. Well, it's funny is interesting that you mentioned like the traditional ad space. So, for instance, advertising on ESPN or televised football games. I've noticed that people are just really turning on like DraftKings and FanDuel because of how much they're doing it there. But what's fascinating yeah. to me is I was in this, you know, I, I was a DFS fan earlier and I'm a huge podcast fan. And so basically both DraftKings and FanDuel put a tremendous amount of marketing into podcasts. You know, the Short Corner podcast that we were huge fans of, you know, they, they ran DraftKings ads. Uh, the Cracked podcast still does them. And they, they were everywhere in podcasts for a while. And I didn't notice the same vitriol and, and hate. And that's one of the interesting things about online advertising versus, say, television advertising is there is – it's funny to me because if you get one or two ads for a podcast, that is stickier or at least more likely for me to remember it than if you get 10 yeah. ads on, say, a Super Bowl commercial. And the issue with 10 ads in a Super Bowl commercial slot is that um, – you're going to be able to charge a lot more for it. So it is really, it's one of the, it kind of feels money ballish, right? Where you're basically looking at advertisers and going, the people with the money to spend on advertisements don't actually, you know, they, they, they do what works. This is really popular on the Freakonomics podcast. He talks about how uh, Steve Levitt, one of the authors of Freakonomics and regular on the Freakonomics podcast, would talk about how he would consult with companies and essentially these companies would basically ask for advice and they'd give it to them and they'd go, well, that's not how we do things. And so one of his fam famous examples is <laughs> someone got fired because they didn't put a circular into a oh, this sound. It doesn't it get weird, Brian, when we talk about like old school days? So in a newspaper, which is these things you used to pay to have delivered that would have the news and ads in them. We're going to have to give some a, more footnotes on that. No, sorry. Oh, my God. Going. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was I, I was thinking about explaining Blockbuster at some point, but anyway, so newspapers, Ooh, you know, they have to do a show on that. They have circulars in them, right? That are advertisements, and they they explain how someone got fired because they basically spent a certain amount of money on circulars every year, and this person forgot to put circulars in the newspapers like for a month, and they were like, "This was such a horrible mistake," and this person got fired. And you know, Levitt asked a very simple question where he said, "Well, did you look at your sales those months and see if those circulars mattered?" Like. It was a perfect experiment because basically they forgot to put the uh, advertisements in a specific market for a month, whereas they had had the advertisements elsewhere. So you could do a nice study, right, and say, did our sales change at all in this one market versus other markets? And the answer is it didn't. So basically they were just throwing money away at these circulars that, you know, if you remember newspapers, you'd see the ads and you just throw them out. Like no one looks at those. So um, it's funny that in advertisement, I think – we're getting all of these new metrics. It, it feels very sportsish. We've got all these new metrics, all these new analytics, and I still feel that a lot of the decision making is still very old school. Yeah, for sure. And um, you know, for DraftKings specifically, uh, you know, I dug up this article here from uh, let's see, Recode.net. I have no idea who that is, if this is legit or not, but um, they the article says DraftKings will pay ESPN. 200 million for ads over the next two years so and down below they say as part of that deal DraftKings has agreed to commit 500 million in advertising spend with Walt Disney owned ESPN properties being the summer it was a huge commitment for a company that had raised just 41 million dollars in funding and brought in 30 million in revenue last on year on that and if, if anybody in the comments knows and wants to correct us what I will say is Briefly, Disney was going to acquire DraftKings and ended up uh, not. Okay. And this article is from July this year. Part of that acquisition deal was DraftKings spending a lot of money. So basically, DraftKings at, at this point has essentially been valued at about a billion dollars uh, based yeah. on previous funding rounds. And so ESPN or Disney was going to acquire essentially a 20 to 25% stake in the company. And part of the agreement for that acquisition was them spending a bunch of money on ESPN ad revenue. 
Yeah, and that makes some sense. And, you know, with these valuations, we were just talking about this with Twitch, right? You know, even if they aren't making money, they have so many eyeballs that, you know, I feel like maybe five to 10 years ago, there was people would say, well, these sites have all these eyeballs, but don't know how to make money. I feel like a lot of these sites have, I mean, YouTube's a great example, right? They started making money. So I feel like that's finally starting to come true and people are probably realizing that. But um, just the reason for bringing this article up is it looks like DraftKings is doing sort of an all of the above strategy. They're spending that much money with ESPN. I imagine a lot of those are TV ads. A lot of those are probably internet ads. They're spending money at TwitchCon to have a booth there trying to bring in a younger demographic. So yeah, just like you said. Well, what's funny, because you mentioned uh, some of the old guard in terms of e-gaming mentioning, hey, we've seen this before. We've seen venture capital come in and try and yeah. monetize and fail. And I think that's, by the way, that is that is a fantastic view to have. It, it, it is a good view to be skeptical of massive success. But what I'll point out, we were talking pre-show a little bit about this. The iPad was like, I don't even know the iteration of I the tablet the PC that the iPad was. You can go back to, to you know, Microsoft and, you know, they were waving around uh, essentially tablet computers in the 90s. If you look at Star Trek in the 80s, you know, Picard was holding a tablet PC in most of those episodes. That was what people thought the future of, of home computers was in 19, in the, the mid-1980s. And it took, you know, 20 years for it to really be in a good spot where everything kind of came together perfectly. You know, one of a few of the things that really helped the iPad and tablet PCs take off. One was like the type of glass, it's called like Gorilla Glass, I think, was really important because um, it made them more durable and you know able to you know run your finger across it. Um, the internet, obviously, faster internet speeds, so you could download software and stuff. But it's, it's possible for a good idea to fail because the market circumstances were not correct. So I am 100% behind people who are skeptical at the odds of success for e-gaming. At the same time, I'm saying a lot has changed, and this includes like DFS, like daily fantasy sports, having a market of people that want to spend money to essentially try and determine who's going to be the best at that. I think that builds in a market that you couldn't kind of have before because one of the issues about, I think, e-gaming that I've heard is it was hard to televise because the casual person couldn't tell what was going on. Well, one of the great things about fantasy sports, this is not even daily fantasy, but fantasy in general, is it increased the number of fans who wanted to watch the game for random actions, even if it didn't matter for the outcome. You know, there are people that will watch a garbage time football game with the hope of an extra field goal or an extra touchdown. So, you know, I think the same for in terms of esports, that could be huge. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And I, I found a YouTube video of Picard with his iPad, which is kind of funny. Love We're it. That right Love now. it. We'll have that in the show notes for all the audio listeners. And it actually, the design does look pretty similar to an iPad. That's, that's funny. But no, that's a great analogy um, because Twitch and YouTube coming into esports is what really helped it blow up. That all these people could broadcast for cheap and a lot of people could watch for cheap. Well, well I'll even point out like the box score geeks and Wages of Winds are a ton of fun. Three or four years before, the idea of those kinds of websites, so I think uh, Wages of Wins launched, I think, in 2006, and I think Box Score Geeks launched, and I think Patrick launched, I think, NBA Geek in 2009 or 2010. If you even go to the early 2000s, the idea of launching your own website was actually terrifying because if yeah. you had what happened, what happened to me when I wrote my first article at Wages of Wins is ESPN linked it, and I, I got some you know immediate heat because I was actually calling Mellow overrated, I believe. Um, but... What used to happen is you'd sign up for a web server, you'd have a website, you would basically expect that no one would look at that website. And then if a bunch of people looked at that website, it was kind of like the old school AOL days. For those of you that don't know, when the internet was new, you would pay for internet by the hour. And then if you went by over- By the minute even. Oh, wow. If you yeah. went over your prescribed monthly quota, they basically charged you a ton. So it'd be like, we'll give you 20 hours a month for 50 bucks. And then every additional hour is like five bucks an hour or something. So it, you could rack up a lot of money quickly. In fact, I did that my first month on AOL.com. So, um, you know, the idea of making a website for, you know, that could support at random times 10,000 people in a day looking at it uh, was not really that affordable for the casual person. And then technology changed. And that's why we have, you know, Square, Squarespace. What's the Square site that, you know, yep. every... Every, is it Squarespace? I feel bad yeah. that I'm forgetting the name because they advertise everywhere too and I apparently can't remember the name. But uh, Squarespace, you know, WordPress, all this stuff came about and made it possible. 
And so I think that the same might be true of e-gaming. I'm actually, I'm going to be, you know, I don't have any money on the line and I have any stake in it, so I don't care. I'm going to be cautiously optimistic that the cir circumstances between things like Twitch, between things like daily fantasy sports, that it could actually change the viability of it being a successful product. And one thing we discussed when we talked uh, e-gaming a couple shows ago was just, you know, it is way, way um, easier morally to be a fan of esports than any major sport at this point. Every major sport in the United States is exploitative at the college level or causes brain, like your two choices are causes brain damage or is exploitative or it's baseball and who likes baseball. <laughs> yeah. Well, so to be fair, one of the, one of the reasons why, and I like the point you said earlier about, um, you know, people being skeptical of things failing and that's good, but it's not necessarily true, right? Because who's involved in the implementation matters. Well, that's kind of the problems esports has had in the past is that um, there's just been straight up like scam artists and just really bad people involved in it at times. So, you know, hopefully there's more serious companies involved, which it seems like there are now and they're starting to root that out. But um, and another thing from that old school esports panel that you just touched on is um, a question was asked. What do you guys think is the official way to spell it? Capitalization and hyphens and everything. Oh my is it e-gaming? Is it esports? No, no, this is important. Okay, they said it should be E-S-P-O-R-T-S, -S, all lowercase, no spaces, no hyphens. So that's so, what I'm going to go with. In a past life, I was a GIS analyst. Um, mm. And so GIS is a geographic information system. So it's like databases that tie with maps. Back in the day, this was a, a huge thing, huge industry, obviously, things like Google Maps, et cetera, have, and you know, even uh, D3 with um, the chart visualizations have changed a lot of what that means. But back when I did it, uh, one of the biggest companies for the technology, which was a desktop application, still is, I'm sure there's still a lot of money in it, um, was ESRI. But then all the old people called it Esri. And so there was actually, I went to a uh, conference as well on it, and basically it was the same debate where they were like, is it ESRI? Is it Esri? What's the official ruling? They actually made an official ruling. I believe they said it was ESRI. And then old people were like, no, we're not going to change it. So it's like, all this stuff is just silly to me. But I mean, that that's a good start. Congrats. Esport, and that helps me for articles. So for articles I write now, it's going to be esports all over the case. I'm actually glad as an editor that I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Drew. I think I think you're being sincere, so that's good. I'm that, I'm sincere on that. Like it's funny because I'm like this is like let me let me phrase it another way. This is a silly, pointless, pointless debate and argument, and the only people it benefits are anal retentive editors of blogs. So as an anal retentive editor of a blog, thank you. That's right. Yeah, and we've got the uh, Esri slash ESRI site up here right now. It looks pretty nice. Very modern site. Oh, nice to hear they're doing that because they. There's a lot I could talk there, but that's a, that's a former life, and I don't care as much anymore. <laughs> okay, well, we're actually, we've gone really long on this, so um, I don't I'm know how fine. you want to do mean, this. I, I thought this was a filler show, and um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm happy to talk esports, daily fantasy, something that might actually make our site money. It's still the off season. I mean, I know yeah. football's on, and I, I do enjoy football, despite, you know, I enjoy both football and discussing all of the moral implications of football. It's one of my favorite pastimes, the self-hating fan. Uh, didn't really, you know, we, we've talked it, I think, as you've mentioned, we've talked it a lot. And so I was just like, you know, this week I don't really want to be the downer that's just like, yay, football's fun, but, you know, look at all the number of quarterbacks that are injured. Actually, I'm getting into the downer note already. Like, Peyton Manning is a 40-year-old man playing football, and every time he is sacked, which is a lot because the Broncos really need to improve their offensive line, uh, it is, you know, it is tragic to watch. And, you know, he's even admitted this is Peyton Manning on the Broncos. He can't feel his fingertips and hasn't been able to for years. So, you he know, he had Peyton spinal Man fusion surgery, something like that. He had that. That's that was the big issue with, you know, him and the Colts where basically he had to take a season off for that. That's when they drafted Luck and decided to part ways. So, you know, it's it's one of these you're like, I put him up there with Mick Foley where I'm like, some of the stuff he's done yeah. is amazing. His performance in the NFL, including with the Broncos in the last couple of seasons, is nothing short of astounding. Some of his commercials are funny, like him and Eli Manning have done some great ones. They actually have a rap about fantasy football. So all of that stuff is great, and I'm like, I'm doubting that his mental faculties will be there when he's 60. Yeah. That's so a good analogy, actually, Mick Foley. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, one of the sad things, because um, I actually did a little research on this, is I was reading about McFoley, and as I mentioned, I, he's really popular and uh, you know great, great author, and you know he does stand-up comedy, comedy now, and 
you know, did a help the documentary on Santa Claus. All this stuff is great. And I looked up something, and I guess a few years ago when he was um, part of TNA, which is another wrestling organization, uh, Dave Meltzer gave a bad review of one of their pay-per-views. And Mick Foley, I guess, penned a 4,000-word article um, basically against Dave Meltzer and all the problems. And some people were like, this sounds like raving gibberish. And, you know, this is mm. out of someone who's like, who is clearly a very smart person and a very talented person. And so you, you start wondering where it's like when you start seeing those breaks where you're like, okay, this person is really, really smart, but has had a lot of hand problems. What's that going to cause? You know, that came out and then other people admitted that, you know, he'd have various times where he'd drive home and would forget how to get home and call his wife or that he, when he was in hotels, he would kind of wander the hall because he couldn't remember his hotel room. So it's like, you know, even if you see them after their sport is done and they still do stuff you like, you read these stories and you realize just how much they put on the line. And, you know, there was a good article on Peyton Manning this week about how he can't, like, take off his cleats on his own. So, yeah, it's, you know, when you're talking uh, moral ambiguity, not even moral ambiguity, it's just like this guy has completely ruined his body for his, this sport. And uh, we benefit from that as fans, and that's always a little uncomfortable. Mm, mm. And as I said, we, we talked about that a bunch. We were going to talk this this week. So we, we got your daily, um, you know, feel bad about football in. So we got that. Um, do we want to talk the wall of boredom, I guess? Or do you have anything else to add on TwitchCon or anything else? Anything else on TwitchCon that was interesting to you? Because we use Twitch. I'm interested in the future of, you know, content providers and online streaming and daily fantasy sports. Was there anything else you saw there? Oh, there was so much. And that was what I regret is I just didn't have time to prepare at all. But um, I'll just finish up the very first point, which was um, since YouTube did not and Google did not buy Twitch in the end, it went to Amazon. Now they're competing on both. Twitch just announced they're going to really make their video on demand, their VOD system a lot better. And uh, YouTube has actually moved into live streaming specifically targeted at gaming, which is Twitch's audience. I, so I they're going like... to compete directly on both products. I like YouTube for content. And as an online provider, I will say this. Content trumps UI. And I know I'm going to piss off yeah. a lot of designers saying that. But I've seen, like, <laughs> Cracked is one of my favorite sites, and they are so out of date. And they know it. Like, I actually I actually had a discussion at one point in their their forums. I just went in and asked a question. It was like, they do they have a template for doing, uh, like, photoplasties, which is where they have their users make, you know, uh, images with phrases on it. And then they give them a subject, and they produce the best 20, you know, basically memes. And the thing is, they have a template for that. So if they ever want to make their own, you know, hey, our writers made these 20 as opposed to our readers, it still looks like it's a contest, even though it shouldn't. And that's because it's clearly a web template that they have to use that was written years and years ago. And I can totally hear, because I actually worked as a web consultant, if you try and completely change the technology of your site, and in doing so, change the site mapping of your site, you make it harder to find on Google, older links mm. start breaking, that can completely destroy basically how easy it is to find your site and how popular your site is. And that can also affect things like ads. So on the internet, having content trumps having a fantastic interface. Now, ideally, you have both. But so what I will say when you're talking Twitch getting into YouTube versus YouTube getting into Twitch, I have, and we put stuff on YouTube, I have yet to be impressed with like any UI changes that YouTube makes. And because it's plugged into Google, I mean, I guess Twitch is plugged into Amazon now, so it, you know, it could be the same boat. Twitch has had, you know, Twitch is a much better UI and much better system in my opinion. YouTube, you know, has had the problems of like integrating with Google Plus because Google wants, you know, Google Plus to be a big thing. So I'm slightly more on the side of Twitch here with Amazon. But what I'll also point out is, you know, you could look at computers in the 1980s and say, how could you know, Windows ever beat, you know, Macintosh. And uh, we saw that turned out. Yeah, for sure. And um, I agree with all that. And just to kind of add a third leg to that table, I guess, if you want to put it that way. I made a two leg table, I guess. That's well, a table, but okay. potentially. All right. Potentially. Keep going. Sure. But how about a fifth leg then to that table? All no, right, but anyway, they it, no. So the reason why Google slash YouTube, of course, and then Twitch as well, you know, a little more miraculously succeeded is um, the technology, basically, that um, like we were talking about earlier, traditionally, it has been incredibly difficult to serve videos without a lot of latency at a high quality and a, frame, a high frame rate all over the world at once, right? 
to a huge number of people. And that was um, like the entire, um, I just finished watching Silicon Valley season two. Mm. And I was like, that's the entire software platform that they talked about on that show. Oh, I should watch it then. Oh, but I no. love Silicon Valley. It's a good show. You should check <laughs> it out. I watched a few episodes. I would love it. I love Mike Judge. Kumail Nanjiani is one of the funniest people He's on the internet. Funny. And you need to watch him. That, that's my thought. Okay, so sorry, I cut you off again. Oh, but one of the big reasons Twitch succeeded and all these other guys failed, and YouTube also for that matter, is yeah, they just built great platforms that are really strong and s scaled really well. In fact, my friend who saw uh, Twitch's CEO, Kevin Lin, speak uh, said that was making fun of him because the word scaling was like, you know, take a shot whenever he says scaling. But it's true, you know. You, that's... Oh, by the way, I worked at Google and the word scale, like, yeah, like if, if you took a shot every time there was a, to a, a yeah. talk at Google about scale, like you would just, you would die. You would, you but would think die about of what alcohol poisoning. Kevin Lin, again, the CEO of Twitch, think about what his life has been for the, or sorry if CEO is in his title, he might be a vice president. Or, he's basically like second in command there, I think, uh, behind the CEO Emmett. But anyway, the, the point is they've been there. They are the fourth you know, highest traffic on the web or whatever now. And they've just had to somehow keep their platform afloat during all that growth. And they've, their company is almost all engineers. So yeah, I mean, that's the real challenge for companies growing that fast. It's even more than the UI and all that. And he is CEO and co-founder. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dre. Got but yeah, back. I mean, the, the stuff that makes technology, it, it is always fascinating as a, his, as a historian of, you know, the tech field to look at why certain things succeeded and other failed. And one of my favorite kind of stories is, you know, if you compare the iPod to the mini disc player to mm -hmm. Betamax versus VHS, like the reasons for all of those technologies made a lot of sense and in some cases worked and some didn't. That's the comparison basically. Uh, Betamax, Betamax is to the mini disc as VH or actually Betamax is to, um, the iPod, basically, as VHS is to the mini disc, and mm. obviously we see the, those two technologies flipped in terms of which succeeded in the market, which is always funny. It's like things that seem like a really good technology decision at the time turn out to be wrong, and the technology the decisions that matter and cause success, we can't know till I, it's the hindsight is twenty twenty. But yeah, to your point on like the the video on demand or streaming services that succeed. Yeah, the scale part has been a huge part of that because so many people with like smartphones and just better internet access has exploded the number of people that can watch videos uh, on the internet. Yeah, the 2009 streaming revolution, that's a thing people say on the internet. Ooh, love it. I have to yeah. tell more about that. Yeah. Any, anything else like this is like, I, I know we, I, I'm for the listeners that followed along and that for found this teases. interesting. You rock. You rock so much because uh, this is interesting to, I think, all the people. I'm sure Patrick would be in the same. Patrick actually worked for Amazon at one point. So I'm sure oh, this would be interesting. Right. I'm sure this would be interesting to Patrick at, at some point, but uh, if, if he wants to talk it. But I think we, we like, we're looking forward to talking basketball. And the good teaser is we're getting in a good boat to talk that more. The, the problem being the only real topic I had for this week on basketball I was in a huge mood to talk about was Chris Ball versus Kobe Bryant. I think. I'm going to wait a little to, to give you more on that. Um, but the good news is we're getting more tools to, to make that demonstration easier. As Brian said, I know that is a tease, but that, that's what you get. On the same note, to tie it into our wall of boredom, there are a couple moves this week, some you know more people getting promoted. But the big one is Meta World Peace is going back to the Los Angeles Lakers. As we mentioned, the wall of boredom is when we talk over the off-season moves and acquisitions that occurred during the last week, and we've kind of t trailed off on that as it's sort of disappeared. Lakers, what are you doing, is all I can say to this. Like, it's not 2009 anymore. He wasn't even that great in 2009. Like, he was, he was a productive member of a team that won a title. But, you know, it's like Derek Fisher, right? Derek Fisher and Metal World Peace help teams win titles, but they're not the reason the teams won the titles. It's Lamar Odom, Pau Gasol, Kobe Bryant. That's right, I listed Kobe third there. But the, the Lakers are just not going to be good next season. Anybody, I just bought NBA 2K16. Kobe Bryant's rated 85. That is freaking absurd. The Warriors are also ranked as the 10th best team in the league, even though they're one of the 10th best teams all time and just won a title. So I don't know what's going on NBA 2K16, but I do, I can say this, barring a major trade, the Lakers are going to be a train wreck next season, and it is going to be fun to watch. <laughs> 
Well, so they did. They've got some guys, right? They got Ed Davis, a couple other guys, but yeah, it's just not enough in the West, is it? You cannot have a team with Kobe Bryant playing over a thousand minutes and expect your team to do well when Kobe Bryant is in his mid thirties and two years away from ever being a productive player and going through injuries. It's like that is the rough thing about sports. Like I read uh, one of the great books um, was called The Showtime Lakers. Uh, I think it was by Jeff Perlman. And what was really fascinating about this book to me is he's talking about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and basically how Kareem Abdul-Jabbar kind of didn't seem as into it and was, you know, kind of tailed off later in his career and just didn't want it as much and the drive. And it's like that's one possibility, but it's just worth noting in sports people get old. And so I always laugh when I hear the, like how much they want it and like Kobe Bryant's intensity as if Kobe Bryant's intensity is going to overcome the fact that he's had like two major surgeries in the last two years and is in his mid thirties. And, and, you know, before that was degrading as a player. So I, I always love that people think that, um, you know, how much you want something in sports can overcome a lot of other stuff. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying people overrate it. I find a lot. Yeah, for sure. But boy, Dre, what if he does come back? Well, it could happen and then you'll be wrong. No, but did, yeah, you're right. Did, you have then to look at what's on, most likely to happen, right? And Then he'll be on some new steroid, and the NBA should do their best to make sure it's legal and give it to all their old athletes so they can extend the career of great players. That's going to be my take. Just like if Mick Co- Foley. Um, well, no, that's not even right at all. Like Mick Foley should have stopped wrestling way earlier because of the concussion. Issue. Like That's the funny thing. Like If there's a way to extend your career in the NBA or Major League Baseball, yeah, you're not going to be walking the same when you're 50 because of all the stress you've given your body, but you can probably still be thinking. Okay, and I can buy that any argument. Sport, any sport that, that has a lot of chances for you to get hit in the head, and actually it occurs to me, baseball is one of these, right? You can get hit in the head with the ball. Um, you know, you, you just, you, you know, the way this is actually Bret Hart that says this, it's you've, you've got one brain. So, mm. uh, yeah, you know, that's the unfortunate, when I talk Peyton Manning, when I talk McFoley, the unfortunate part is there is, you know, it would be revolutionary if there was any form of new medical tool that could basically preserve their brains because, with what we know now, pretty much that's that's not going to happen. Yeah, and these transactions, though, to close it up, none of these guys are going to matter for their teams. It's very unlikely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I mean that, and that goes without saying. Like the way the NBA offseason works is you've got all these big name players that go, you know, in the first couple of weeks, and everybody's where's LeBron? Where's LeBron going to go? Or where's so and so going to go? I'm really looking forward to the summer of Kevin Durant. Um, I'm really hoping he goes to the Wizards, as I've said repeatedly. But, uh, you know, when you get into the dog days of the offseason and football season, yeah, this is this is not an exciting time to be an NBA fan. But the excitement is NBA 2K16 is out. So I hope you picked up your copy. I've been playing mine and we can all argue about how stupid the ratings are. Uh, (laughs) The NBA season, that means the NBA season is close to starting, which is a lot of fun. And we're you know, I've got lots of historical stuff I've been looking at. It'll be fun, but I'm more excited because one, one thing I found out as an NBA content provider, Brian, is if you do an article on something new, people, you can get lots of views. When you're like, man, weren't the 1983 bucks amazing? No one cares. This is a point Ty Willinghands, a friend of the show, said years and years ago on his blog, which should come back. I think it was called Courtside Analyst. Um, but yeah, people don't care as much about historical data as a lot of the really into it people do like us. So, well, in that that's case, why- Gray, I'll tell you that on Monday, September 28th today, the Bucks named Rod Thorne as a special consultant. So that's your Bucks news for today. Rod Thorne. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, th- thank you. Old school thank- NBA insider now on the Bucks. Thank, thank you for that. Um, all right. Anything else to end on the show? Because I think we started a little late, but we've gone about an hour. So. Yeah, we're we're about an hour. So you're just going to say we're going to do nothing on these alpha tools. We're just going to totally leave them hidden. I Okay, so just at least so this isn't like too inside NBA or whatever. I've started looking at some more tools. So if you go to the Boxscore Geeks site, boxscoregeeks.com, and click on the tools tab at the top, or you can also get to that uh, boxscoregeeks.com forward slash players forward slash compare. This is the comparison engine that we currently have, which lets you compare various players in a given year, and it's really useful. So like the one I'll give you right now, the one that always interests me, is if you look at Chris Paul versus Kobe Bryant in 2008, uh, you know, basically when they, I believe, were one and two for the MVP and Kobe Bryant unjustly got the MVP, and we show stuff like how Chris Paul, how much, how he did per minute and how that compared to the average point guard and how... 
Kobe Bryant compared to the average shooting guard. I've been working on some stuff to help further visualize that, which we hope to have out in the upcoming offseason. I showed Brian like the very, very first, the beta version of it. And so that's really cool, but we're not, we're not quite ready to roll it out. So that's where we're at. But yeah, we are very excited about being able to, you know, visually show, for instance, why it matters so much that, you know, yeah, sure, Chris Paul got 26.9 points compared to Kobe Bryant's 34.9 points per 48 minutes that in 2008. But that when we look at their, you know, and that, by the way, they had the exact same true shooting. That's remarkable. So they had the exact same true shooting. So, of course, Kobe Bryant's more points matters more than Chris Paul's. But when we get into the fact that, you know, Chris Paul's assist to turnover ratio was just so absurd and how that actually ends up mattering more and how that really influences the points over par metric we use to to value performance. So, you know, basically we said in 2008, Kobe Bryant was a very good player. And essentially, if we're looking at the spread, Kobe Bryant was worth 0.3 points to the spread for the Lakers. But if we look at Chris Paul, he was worth 0.8, which or was worth eight points, which is obviously much better. Oh, do I have the wrong season up here, Jay? I'm, I have 08, 09 up. You have 08, 09, 2007, 2008. Chris okay. Paul was gotcha. per minute about twice as good as Kobe Bryant is what we said. And for the record, we thought they were both amazing that season. We thought they both put up very good numbers. It was just Chris Paul was much better. Oh, I got it now. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's cool. So here's the thing. Um, I've got this up right now, and uh, people that are familiar with the site would be familiar with this. It's just a table, right, that compares the stats that matter for these two players. Basically... Um, Oh, I forget if it's three or four factors from Dean Oliver and Basketball and Paper Dre. Do you remember that? Four, but, oh, man, you're going to get uh, no, but the, hurt so much. It's, the four, point it's, is, it's Dean Oliver's four factors. Four factors. But the point is all those factors are captured by these few box score stats. And so, you know, I don't know, guys like us, we're kind of weird. We're maybe like uh, Tank and Dozer looking at the Matrix encoded. Do you remember that scene? That is, just, that is so true. We can just kind of look at these numbers in the table right away and kind of get a lot out of it. But... When I was looking at some of your graphs, some of your alpha t- uh, stuff, it's so much faster to just dig up this information in your head when you're looking at it. So it's going to be really cool when that comes out. And by out. the way, just so what uh, Brian's talking about, for this has been the tech podcast. So if you made it this far and don't really know tech, alpha, you know, it's just basically there are different levels. Of ah, the- thank you. And, you know, we actually, we should take that down. We still call the box for geeks beta because that's what we called it when it came out. So alpha is like the first iteration that doesn't go on anybody. Beta is when you like release it to the public and let other people look at it. Then you have a final product that you know you charge, and then Google. Alpha acquired. is what a real man is, Dre. They don't put up a oh. shit or beta men at all. Men's rights forever. Uh, no, I, I'm not even going to approve of the oh, sarcastic okay. thing. The box score geeks does not approve or endorse Brian's position, uh, and Brian was being sarcastic. I hope. That I would don't be endorse a, my position either. That, that would be like a really weird, uh, you know, heel turn on the show, Brian. If you, oh, like, if, you if after all turns. this, you're just like, I'm a, I'm a men's right activist. I'd be like, what? How have you been producing this show for as long as you have? <laughs> uh, but yeah, to Brian's, Brian, that that point was actually hilarious. The looking at the Matrix. So Jeremy Britton, a fan of the show, I met him once in person, and I had just read an economics paper that had a uh, ordinary least source table in it. These are the regressions that economists do to prove that things like the price of popcorn impacts attendance at games or whatever. So, and by the way, that metaphor I'm like stealing from Dean Oliver, he makes uh, an offhand reference in the intro to the book about sports economists Mm. uh, in basketball and paper. But anyway, so I, I, there was this table in this thing and it was actually about attendance or um, viewership data for the World Series. And there's this fantastic table about the things that impact the man. And I thought it was incredible. And so I showed it to Jeremy. And yeah, it's, it's a table with all these numbers and asterisks and significance things. And Jeremy was like, what am I looking at? And I, and I had to go like line by line and explain it. And, and it can be the same thing here. We're like, when we've got this table on the players compare tab, where we're like, okay, so this points thing, right? 26.9 versus 34.9. Well, that's important, but then you have to look at efficiency as well. And then after you look at efficiency, you have to look at like these other things. And then you have to look at position. You're right. It's, it is like the matrix where we're looking at a bunch of these numbers and we can kind of, I can look at a box score. I can look at this and quickly internalize it. But to a casual fan, that's not as easy. And that's one thing we're trying to fix. And you have now made me way over hype at Brian. I don't appreciate that, but yeah, we'll, we'll show that at some point. Well, what uh, I said will never match my internal hype. I had to play it down quite a bit actually oh i did that just for you well thank you i appreciate that okay so anyway that is our show um hope you enjoyed the filler dfs esports thing as we mentioned one last plug own the play.com sign up use the key the uh, key phrase geek 25 
uh, when you deposit $1. You can do it from PayPal, give you $25 free. It's a fantastic deal. I think it's the best daily fantasy sports uh, deal on the web right now. So that's why we're endorsing it. Uh, if you found us not through our site, we are at boxscoregeeks.com. Further plug there. Go to boxscoregeeks.com forward slash players forward slash compare. If you want to look at the comparison engine, get yourself ready for this upcoming season. Uh, we are on iTunes and Stitcher as the Box Score Geek Show. Uh, subscribe to us, upvote us. All of that, of course, helps. As we just mentioned, we're in love with Twitch. You can find us on twitch.tv forward slash nerd numbers. Um, I think we're going to be broadcasting Tuesday or Wednesday, probably during the football season. I'll, we'll, we'll figure out a time. If you follow us on Twitter, that's uh, Nerd Numbers and Box Score Brian. We will definitely tweet out when we go live. And then, of course, you can find all of our historical shows on the Nerd Numbers channel on YouTube. I think that's all the links I need to plug, Brian. And with that, we'll see you next week. <laughs>